This material has been excerpted from the college television course, The Mechanical Universe, and re-edited specifically for use in the high school curriculum. The Mechanical Universe is funded by the Annenberg CPB Project, made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation. The nuts and bolts that hold together the complex machinery of the modern world are no more important in the history of civilization than the simple flow of water. Learning to control and harness the flow of water has been a critical ingredient in the development of civilization. In order to flourish, every society had to develop the means to manipulate, control, and distribute the flow of water for irrigation, for the draining of swamps, and to nourish the growth of cities. Just as all roads led to Rome, so did an ingenious network of aqueducts. The empire survived as long as it did, to a large degree, because the aqueducts brought down fresh water from the hills of Albinus. In their time, those complex circuits of pipes that distributed water to the city's baths, buildings, and fountains were amazingly sophisticated. But only in the last century did another flowing technology begin to develop. Electricity. Inventors such as Thomas Edison found ways to manipulate electric currents to light lamps and houses and to carry dots and dashes long distances through wires. They also created ways to generate and distribute electricity in ever more complex grids. The very existence of a major city such as Los Angeles depends on many kinds of circuits. Whether designing water circuits or electric circuits, it all boils down to controlling the flow of currents. 163,000 cubic meters of water per hour flow through the Colorado River aqueduct toward the Los Angeles Basin. 1.3 amps of electric current flow through this copper wire. Just as water makes life possible, the flow of electricity makes light possible. How much light depends on the amount of current, which is measured in amps. One amp is one coulomb of electric charge per second flowing through a circuit. In other words, electric current is the rate of flow of electric charge. At any instant, this current is the same everywhere along the wire. Because electric charge, like water, is neither created nor destroyed along the way. It just keeps flowing along. While rivers have flowed for thousands of years, electricity was basically a static field until 1800. That was the year Alessandro Volta charged ahead and invented the battery. This new source of power, called the voltaic pile, made a sustained flow of electricity possible. 
and opened the floodgates of progress. Later, in the 19th century, Thomas Edison used the continuous flow of electric current provided by a voltaic pile to develop the first electric lamp. He also used that current to perfect a device invented by others, the telegraph. The telegraph held the promise of almost instantaneous long distance communication. But in the beginning, the promise of long distance calling was short lived. After traveling a few kilometers, the signal was too weak to detect. That problem was solved by Charles Wheatstone, a musical instrument maker and a student of acoustics. He found the solution to this dilemma in the almost unintelligible writings of an obscure German professor named George Simon Ohm. What Ohm had predicted with abstract mathematical reasoning, Wheatstone showed through direct experiment. The signal can be kept the same size if the voltage is increased in proportion to the distance. Wheatstone had verified the rule known as Ohm's law. To make a current, I, flow through a conducting material, a voltage, V, is needed. The current is always proportional to the voltage. The constant of proportionality is called the inverse of the resistance R. In the form V equals I times R, this equation is known as Ohm's law. An element with resistance in an electric circuit is called a resistor. Ohm's law isn't a fundamental law of nature like Newton's second law or the law of conservation of energy. It doesn't hold in all situations, but it's a very useful rule in most practical situations. And through miles and miles of wire, the flow of information follows from the practical use of Ohm's law. And in much the same way, similar rules lead hydraulic engineers in the design and operation of aqueducts. Those engineers have long known that the rate at which water flows through a pipe depends on just a handful of factors the slope of the land and the pressure applied, the length and diameter of the pipe, and the viscosity and density of water. In precise analogy, the amount of electric current that flows through a resistor depends on the voltage drop across it, how wide and how long it is, and what it's made of. The resistance of an electric resistor is proportional to its length. Inversely proportional to its area. And proportional to its resistivity or its tendency to inhibit the flow of electrons. This tendency to resist is something all materials have, but to varying degrees. Adding resistors to a circuit, one after another, has the same effect as making one resistor longer. These are called resistors in series. Putting resistors side by side increases the area through which the current can flow. These are called resistors in parallel and they have a lower resistance than either one alone. The same is true of water. Adding sections of pipe in a series is the same as making it longer, and so the resistance to movement increases. But if the pipes are added side by side, they can carry more water more easily. Resistivity is like viscosity. The more of it a material has, the slower a particle will move through it. But what slows the electrons down 
In other words, in a conductor, what resists the flow of electricity. Inside a metal, electrons constantly move in all directions. Here, just a few of them are represented as dots. This kind of movement encounters no resistance, nor does it create a net flow in one end and out the other. Under these conditions, the conductor is an electrostatic equilibrium. There's no electric field inside, no voltage difference from one end to the other. But if a battery makes an electric current flow, equilibrium is destroyed, and an electric field is created inside the conductor. Inside a perfect crystalline metal, if a sample of it could be found, the mobile electrons would continuously accelerate like a penny falling in a vacuum. But in the real world, crystals aren't perfect. They have defects and impurities, and their atoms vibrate with thermal energy. Electrons, accelerated by the force of the electric field, bounce off each imperfection, behaving somewhat like a ball in a pinball machine. All that bouncing, all that stopping and restarting, produces the resistance that prevents the electron flow from building up speed. So the electrons move at a constant average speed, creating a constant current under the influence of a constant force. As the electrons bounce off the imperfections, they set the atoms into larger vibrations. So the kinetic energy of accelerated electrons turns into the heat energy of vibrating atoms. As current, I, flows through a resistor, that heat energy, E, generated, is equal to the amount of charge Q that flows times the change in potential V. Power consumed is equal to the current times the voltage. Using Ohm's law, the power can also be written as I squared R or V squared over R. And what's the result? Well, to start with, it's measured in watts. One watt is a measure of power equal to one amp times one volt. Multiply that watt by a thousand to get kilowatts. Multiply that by a thousand again to get megawatts. At peak hours, Parker Dam generates 120 megawatts. Watts and water, the electric grid and the water system. It's a powerful analogy that takes concrete shape here in this hydroelectric generating plant. The common elements of elementary electric circuits are wires and switches, batteries, resistors and capacitors. And while these elements can be combined into networks of ever increasing complexity, they always obey simple rules. Gustav Kirchhoff, a German physicist, was keen on mathematics. By applying Ohm's law and generalizing it fully, he derived two laws, which can be briefly summarized by using ideas similar to ones we've seen before. One of those ideas is conservation of charge, and the corresponding law for circuits is Whenever one current splits into two, or vice versa, the total current into the junction will equal the total current out of it. Kirchhoff's other law expresses conservation of energy. An electric charge going around any complete circuit neither gains nor loses energy. Kirchhoff's laws hold for both currents of electricity and water. 
Just as man's progress in the civilization of the world has depended on the control of water, the more recent control of electric current is equally remarkable. And the modern city, as much as ancient Rome, depends upon and is limited by the ability to channel and distribute those currents. This material is based upon work supported by the National Science Foundation under grant number SPE 8318420. Any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation.